I confess, my first sex toy was my Whisper 2000 aquarium pump. <laughs> I was 13, Vibration Works. <laughs> Bedpost Confessions is an Austin, Texas-based live show featuring smart storytelling and anonymous confessing. Stories heard at Bedpost Confessions, as well as sister shows Unspoken and Confess, all explore themes of humor, vulnerability, and emotional justice on varying topics. No matter the topic, the highlight of any Bedpost Productions is the participation of the audience members sharing their own secrets in the form of anonymous confessions, which are read aloud during the show. After college, when I was 23, I spent some time in Yemen. I went there to do an unpaid internship with this American nonprofit that produced youth radio programs aimed at teaching young people life skills. I don't know if I was the best person to be teaching young people life skills, though, because I was doing an unpaid internship in Yemen. <laughs> The economy when I graduated was so bad that I took a job that came with kidnapping insurance, but not health insurance. <laughs> I met a lot of great people, though, uh, mostly expats. I hung out a lot with this American who lived down the street from me. I'd go over there, we watched all the Star Trek movies together for some reason. He worked at the consulate, and then... Eventually, when I got back to the United States, at some point I realized that that guy was definitely in the CIA, which is a chapter in my life I now like to think of as the spy who made a concerted but not overly aggressive effort to shag me. There was another American named James who was very handsome, and because he was very handsome, he was very popular among Yemen's expat women. I had a huge crush on him. When I got to the country, he was having this on-again, off-again thing with an older Argentinian woman named Isabella, who was a doctor in Yemen's Doctors Without Borders AIDS program. And then he was ending some kind of romantic entanglement with another woman who was a human rights attorney. And then eventually, his real girlfriend flew to the country. And she was a beautiful British woman who was a journalist with The Economist. It was pretty hard to be jealous because, damn, that is a deep bench. Are you boning women or assembling a really effective UN task force? <laughs> this guy was just out there trying to cast a Shonda Rhimes drama with his dick. Isabella, the Argentinian, and I wound up becoming pretty good friends, and I knew she really liked James, and I wound up sleeping with him anyway in a move I call playing doctors without boundaries. We decided to go visit James on this island where he was spending a holiday rock climbing, and the situation as we went out there was that I had slept with James, and she had slept with James, and I knew about the two of them, but she didn't know about the two of us, and he didn't know if we knew about one another. <laughs> which is a great start to a small island vacation. We flew out there, we got to the meeting point that we'd agreed to over email, and when we got there, we discovered that the day before we arrived, James had changed his mind and hitchhiked a ride on a fishing boat back to the mainland. <laughs> now, this is not Cape Cod, this is less than 50 miles away from Somalia, so... I learned a very important lesson that day, which is that men in life will come and go, but... Female friendship has the power to drive a man into pirate-infested waters. <laughs> it 
Isabella and I, we had a great time on the island. We saw a chameleon and bought frankincense and took pictures of desert rose trees, which are these amazing bulbous trees with tiny stubby little limbs. While we were on the island, on our last day, we were snorkeling on this beach and we discovered that the same day we were on the beach, the president of Yemen at the time and a bunch of his cabinet was visiting. And uh, because even when it was pretty s much safer in Yemen, uh, this island Socotra only got about 10 tourists at a time. So we got to eat lunch with the president and his cabinet. We had lamb and we heard him give a speech about how many cattle were on the island and how many pigs. One less with James gone. And <laughs> I met this guy, Abdulaziz Abdulghani, who I later found out had been a former vice president of Yemen, high up in the cabinet, who turned out to have gone to college in my hometown, two blocks away from where I grew up, at this tiny liberal arts school where my mom worked for over 30 years. So Abdulghani and I traded information and I went back to the mainland, uh, still in Yemen, and a while later, I got a call inviting me to the palace, and I went. I always felt that I would do well in a palace. <laughs> and most especially, a palace not preceded by the word burger or China. <laughs> or in Austin, donut taco. They sent an unmarked black BMW to come pick me up, and for a second I was worried that I might have accidentally stumbled into a Liam Neeson film, but we went to the palace, went through security, and I had to get in a second Jeep, and when I looked down at the floor of this second Jeep, the floor in the back seat was just covered in military weaponry, so uh, I put my feet very gently atop this, the world's most dangerous Ottoman. And we drove into the palace complex and met up with Abdulaziz Abdulreni, and he kind of took me into this gym slash office space. And when we got in there, there was nobody else in there when all of a sudden uh, the president of Yemen, Ali Abdullah Saleh, just comes out from behind a corner with a look on his face that's like, ha ha. Bet you weren't expecting this. <laughs> it is fair to say I was not expecting that at all. The three of us played a couple of rounds of pool, and uh, President Sala openly cheated at pool. <laughs> Before every shot, he would push the cue ball to the most favorable spot on the table. And I still don't know if he just didn't know how to play pool or if he was just super used to pushing his balls around. <laughs> At some point, uh, Abdulaziz Abdulghani excused himself to go work out uh, like a supportive fraternity brother, I guess. And uh, the president of Yemen and I hung out one-on-one -on -one for a bit. And at some point he says to me, so are you married? which is the Yemeni equivalent of, so, do you have a boyfriend? <laughs> I said I wasn't married, and he said, you know, here in Yemen, we have a saying, which is that pretty girls get married and ugly girls finish school. Some number of years later, I'm still not married, and now I have a master's degree. <laughs> but not a PhD. <laughs> so I'll let you all judge the accuracy of that nugget of wisdom. <laughs> I know I look fine. I guess I look like a cross between Uma Thurman and a wax statue of Uma Thurman. <laughs> yeah, 
At some point, the president and I wound up sitting on a sofa next to a hot tub, and he leaned over and he picked up the corner of the ankle-length dirt brown broomstick skirt I was wearing, and he pulls it up a little bit, and he looks at my shoes, these 70s brown go-go boots, and he's like, these are not the delicate shoes of a lady. These are the harsh shoes of a man, an equestrian. <laughs> this was Arabic, but that's the gist of it. <laughs> and all I could think in that moment was, am I getting negged by the president of Yemen? <laughs> So I smoothed my skirt back down over my lap and I straightened up and I said, that is the fashion in my country. <laughs> because I've dated a few scumbags, but never one who was the subject of a position paper by Human Rights Watch. <laughs> A little bit after that, an aide comes into the room where uh, we were sitting and he just says, all right, you will go now. <laughs> so uh, I went, I left. And uh, now every time a man sexually rejects me and I'm feeling bad about myself, I just remind myself that men who have wanted this have killed. No, not for me, just generally. <laughs> Dissidents mostly, I think. <laughs> Honestly, I think the craziest part of this story is still the idea that I could have seduced a world leader while wearing a dirt brown broomstick skirt. <laughs> Uh, I am making light of it now, but at the time it was a frightening experience. I felt like I had kind of brushed something really dangerous. I remember I went home that night and I ate an entire bag of sour raspberry candy and I bought like a bunch of really expensive phone cards and called my mom and I cried. It's fine though, this was uh, the middle of the Arab Spring, like a sn smack dab in the middle. I don't know, ladies, if you know what this is like, but uh, you know when you sexually reject a man and then you just see him start to lose control over the country where he's held a dictatorship for 33 years? <laughs> I do. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. You're so beautiful. Bed Post Confessions is produced by Julie Gillis, Mia Martina, and Sadie Smythe. Audio production is by Ian Danskin. Confess with us at bedpostconfessions.com. Until next time, we will leave you with a few other confessions from the audience. I confess, my ex and I once had hot monkey sex in a Puerto Rican rainforest surrounded by thousands of tiny tree frogs shrieking, Cookie! Cookie! <laughs> I confess, since moving to Austin 11 months ago, I have learned that I really enjoy watching a woman touch my wife. It's just Austin. It's just because of Austin. <laughs> Blaming it on Austin. Okay. It's the tacos. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>